and we'll welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. And we have chef extraordinaire Keith Corbin on the show today. Welcome, Keith. How you doing, man? I'm great. I'm great, man. How's everybody out there? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Diving in to you, and I kind of like to unearth people and, and what they're about. You know, I think chefs are artists. Did you think that you would be a chef? And did you ever think you were an artist? As people, as humans, we all have some art form in some capacity. Never thought that I would be a chef running a restaurant, you know, but I've always called myself called myself a chef, you know, in other areas of my life prior to, you know, being on this side of things. Now you're from Watts, right? Right out of the Jordan Dell Housing Projects, born and raised. Now, looking back at Watts and in and, and growing up in Watts, what does that look like to you now? You know, when you're coming up and you're learning life and you're trying to figure out things and you know more now than you knew then. Is there resiliency there? Is there is there any one thing that kind of sticks out about, hey, you know, I kept with my passion. You know, I stayed I stayed straight. You know, I just I kept going the right way, just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Is there anything that stands out that just kept you going, you know, that kind of drove you to where you are now? You know, I've always had the desire to want more. I always felt it was something more out there outside of Watts. We just didn't have access to it. You know, you, you're sitting in the projects and you're sitting in those porches all day. You just know it's something else out there. You know, but that shit was like Gilligan's Island. You know, there's times where we're teenagers and we get a car. And we, we, we all roll out. We get pulled over and the police take the car and send us right back. No escape, you know, but they always knew it was another world out there. It was something else out there. And, and that's just what it always felt like, you know, at where I sit now and looking back and able to recognize the pitfalls and the disadvantages that the community like Watts has, you know, I really wasn't aware of at that time. But I just always had to fight in me to, to just want more. You know, always had that cream rise to the top type situation going on in my life, you know? When was that epiphany moment where, you know, things are environmental, you know, and I think people become a product of their environment because that's all they experience, you know, because if you don't experience anything else, that's what you become. When did you see a difference in yourself? When did you see the light to make that move or had that? I mean, first, that's I don't believe in being a product of your environment. I believe that you're a product of your beliefs. You know, um, there's many people who were in the same environment that I was in and had different exposures. And so it changed their belief system, right? I have a little brother who seen things from the same lens that I've seen, had like, we're only two years apart. He wanted to go to college, play college football, and went on to do other things. And I went on to be a game banker and off to prison. He's never seen me inside of a jail cell, and he was in the same environment. I think people make choices, right? You can be the same type of person, but if you choose to go one way, that's it doesn't change who you are. You just went that route. You choose one another way, he went that route. I think it's the influences in your life, the exposure that you have, right? There were maybe someone that entered his life that had different conversations, plant different seeds, or even showed him something different that I didn't have access to that I was fortunate to have. He had a football coach. He had another family that was down the street that happened to move to Watts. That kind of took him under. You know what I mean? So even though he was growing up in the same circumstances, situations, still in the same house that I was in, he had other influences um, that I didn't have access to. And I think that the influences you have in your life plays a big part in the path that you take. And I think that when I joined Loco, the restaurant group Loco that Daniel Patterson Work Choice started, those were some new influences in my life, new exposure that brought new opportunity. And, and that path that I took with them led to this position. You know, without those opportunities and influences coming in, I'll probably still be in the same mess that I was in. So that was kind of the epiphany moment when you had that opportunity and saw a different direction? I mean, when you say epiphany moment, it's like you, no, I just followed a path. You know what I mean? I just seized the opportunity. You know, I started building blocks on top of that. And, and, and here we are today. It, it wasn't like, no, I was able to foresee where I'm at today. Like there was no representation uh, in this industry or in my life that would show me that that opportunity would lead to this. Like mm -hmm. I didn't have no representation that I could look toward and say, oh shit, like 
they went through what I've been through. They had this opportunity. They was able to accomplish blah, 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 blah. Like there was none of that, you know what I mean? So it's like for me and my community, I'm trailblazing this path. And hopefully I can be that representation. You know, I do think that you are who you are. And internally you have a, a direction that's kind of a built-in compass. And I think if that person, if you have this ability, you have, you know, whether it's be an artist, painter, chef, whatever it is, if that person is put in a situation by law of attraction, that direction will get stronger unconsciously. I mean, that's a little deep, but uh, when you think about law of attraction, that's what law of attraction is. Did you have or have anybody else in the family that was an artist of any sort that was, you know, father, grandfather, great grandfather? Not to my knowledge. I know when it comes to cooking and, and feeding people, the connection for me was my grandmother. You know, she had, she enjoyed cooking and feeding people. Not to say that she was a chef of no sorts, you know, but she made food out of love and passion and she fed the community. And I think that's my attraction to cooking is feeding people. Like I'm the chef that will bring your first, your first course out to a new guest and witness them try it to get the feedback, you know, enjoy watching the smile put on their face when they take a bite of something that I create. So for me, the passion is feeding people and connecting with people. You know, feeding them um, love through food. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't have no idea about artists in my family. I do believe that we are chefs, are artists. Um, we are creating through food. It's a, it's a form of artistry, yes. For you, maybe a connection to more family in your life. Yeah. Right. In the way of, the way of giving food. When you were gang banging and so forth and went to prison, what was that like? You know, it was just another part of the journey. Um, it was something that I always knew was, was on my path. You know, I, like there was, there wasn't many people that escaped it coming from like, growing up in a community that I grew up in dealing with the circumstances that I was dealing with. No one really escaped that. So I knew at some point that it was part of my journey. But mm -hmm. I was just blessed to to come through it, to go through it and come from under that situation. You know, some people has not been able to make it home. Some people was killed in prison and some people was doing life in prison. And I was fortunate to pass through that part of that journey in my life. You had a direction and you were able to overcome all the things you experienced, you know, yeah. being a gangbanger, going to prison, you overcame that. It, I think it takes a very strong mind to do that. And I don't think some people have that strong of a mind to do that. Do you think some people get caught up where it may create a, a mental illness issue uh, for some people that you, you know, grew up with? I think the trauma starts before the streets and prison, like the community, the way things are set up, the way the systematically designed it, the mm -hmm. shit we have to deal with. My path was chosen before I was even created. The drugs mm -hmm. were introduced to my community before I was born. The red line was introduced before I was even born. Slavery and the way America viewed black people in this, in this country was all created before I was born. The trauma was way before the streets of prison. Yeah. Like this, like way before that. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like this stuff is, is part of our, our life already. It's like ordained. Like this is yeah. something we're going to go through. Now, as far as overcoming it, um, I, I'm not a unicorn. Like, let's get that clear. I'm not a unicorn. Yeah, I might be strong minded and, you know, but if you give, we don't, we won't know how many people are, have the willpower to overcome these situations until we give the opportunities to the community or to the people in the community, right? I was given an opportunity. There's many people that stuck in it that has not had an opportunity to overcome it. You know what I mean? Like it's many mm -hmm. people that has not had that opportunity. So until we afford opportunity to people, we don't know who is um, strong minded enough to overcome the situation. You can imagine growing up in that situation. You don't start reflecting on the life you went through until you're exposed to mm -hmm. another way of life. And they're like, gosh, dang, I'm like, I can't believe we was going through that, man, and they living like this over here. Until you have some retrospect, until you have something to compare it to, it's just normal. It's been perpetuated over and over and over. I mean, For I think that. Generations and generations and generations. It's not recognized as trauma until you brought out of that situation, and now you're dealing with society in another way, and now your way of life doesn't fit. And now you have to take a look at 
why? What is wrong with me? What happened? Okay, this is why I communicate this way. And then it's, okay, it calls from this back in my old life. This, why do I have this drug? It calls from this. Why do I don't trust people? It calls from this. But until you're out of that situation, all those things fit. I don't trust people in this life. I, I don't, you feel me? It, it, it all mm-hmm. goes. So, yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't feel like I had trauma until I started on this path. And it started to hinder my movement. And then I had to turn and face it, which started to clean things up in my life and like really face what was going on. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm like, can't communicate like that with people, you know? Damn, like, why well, can't trust this person? Like, it's my person, like, why can't you, you know? And like, yeah. you have to then wrangle that shit down and figure it out. And then, you know, you realize that, you know, there's a lot of things going on with me from my past life that kind of shaped me in a certain way. That now I have to unravel in order for me to go forward. I'm a, I'm a clear sentient, so I can feel I can feel things, and like if you see something, I can. It's like times twenty for me how I rationalize things, and I, that's why I try to go deep on some things. People don't realize, you know, science is a one way street, and if you look at your subconscious is defined a certain way, your unconscious bias is defined a certain way, and then consciousness is defined a certain way. So when you're born, obviously you bring some lineage to the table. You have an environment that has an effect uh, on your life. But what people don't realize is as soon as you're born, your subconscious is being programmed. You know, then you get to a certain point in life and it speaks to what you're saying, the pattern and the perpetuation. You get to a certain point, you start responding to things with your unconscious bias because you have this innate subconscious programming in you and and people don't realize why they can't find happiness or get to consciousness because they don't know how to deal with that programming and if the programming is really really heavy you know it's a lot of shit to dig out to get to consciousness that's that's above my pay grade <laughs> <laughs> but that's, 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 that's breaking it down that's a session i ain't got to on the couch yet <laughs> we, we get there, I ain't gone to that session yet. <laughs> but but it speaks to if if people understood that, and it speaks to what you're saying. And it's hard to rationalize that. It's hard to understand that. People don't talk about that. I guess what I'm saying is, if you wanted to uh, help that issue, we know there's people out there that know how to make people understand this, right? But they let to to your point, they let it keep going because they know what the programming is doing to the subconscious. Okay. But there's people that are smart enough out there that could get say, hey, this is this is why this is happening, right? From a human being standpoint. This is why this is happening. And there's people out there that know this information. If you were able to understand that, understand where the percentages started and walk that back and explain that to people that are in that situation and, and just continue to chip away, chip away, chip away. You know, I, th- I think that's a way to combat some of those issues. I mean, I know it's tough because yeah. there's so many layers. I think you would have to start at a younger generation for some, because it goes back to that belief. So it's, when, you, when you think about it, the way you're putting it, right, the subconscious training, right? Then you start to, then you start to believe that these things are, are what they are. Uh, whatever that training is, like you start to believe that this is true. This is your reality. And at that point, it's kind of hard to change people's beliefs in reality because now that's the chemical, that's their makeup. That's who they are. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're eight, nine years old and you're thinking about, like, you're not thinking about retaliation. What are you? Because you get programmed early on to hit them back, hit them back, hit them back. They hit you, hit them back, right? So you mm-hmm. start to believe that this is um, the way it goes. Somebody hit me, hit them back, and then that grows into other things. So once you're 19, 15, and you believe this, and this is your reality, it's kind of hard to uh, reprogram people. You know, I mean, you're right. I mean, you're right about that. Yeah. I mean, once you're once it's programmed, it's programmed. You Program. just got to work on it. It's yeah. not until that individual is exposed to something else or go through something, right? That rewires the eyes, that opens mm-hmm. them up, like to be reprogrammed. Sometimes we have to go through to some things to have a shortage in order to make space yeah. to be repro- like to be programmed all over again. And, and I think that um, for me, I'm not going to say it was prison. I'm going to say it was a situation with my my oldest daughter where 
I've hid the lifestyle from her and someone close to me exposed her to who I was in the streets and who I was to the world. And she came and asked me about that. And I think that right there shorted me, you know? It's like, wow. Mm -hmm. And I was open to something different from then on. It's like, this yeah. is how I left my child to know me, you know? And once that, once that registered, it's like, Okay, this is not how I want the world to know me. If I die today, conversations that people are having about me, I'm no longer proud of. And so then I was open to uh, learn something new. How was, long has that been since that experience? About 2014. I think you have a light in you. I mean, you have a light. I believe so, too. As much as I know, I mean, as hard as I know the journey is, it is my passion. And I think my responsibility, you no, know, I believe it's my responsibility to uh to 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 go and to go back and, and and try to help get people to see things differently i hate to say change their beliefs but i think that's what it is like not mm -hmm. just their beliefs about the world but their beliefs about themselves in that situation you never think about yourself you're always worried about everybody else you want to help everybody else you want to protect everybody else because you're giving everything away yeah you never relish anything and that speaks to the pattern and the perpetuation as well you know even when you talk about school and how schools are structured when kids go into school and they want to hit a number and they just hit a number to get that grade. When they when they try to get hit that number, they they do enough to well, hit that number. But when they hit the number and get the grade, they don't relish the information. They don't retain anything. So that pattern or that programming starts in, in school because we're giving it away. We're not relishing anything. We're not creating value for ourselves. We're only doing things to move forward. Yeah. And we put a blanket narrative for everybody instead of creating pocket narratives where people's tone and personalities may fit and these this tone and this group over here can work together and they can learn how they want to learn or this group over here can work together and they can learn how they want to learn we try to create a bar for everybody that doesn't work it doesn't we're work. always giving everything away with that being said you know getting into the food part you know when you got this opportunity how did you develop your style? How did you develop what you cook and so forth? How did you keep improving that process? For one, I have a really close friend, um, Daniel Patterson, who is really, really trained in high level cooking. So I'm fortunate to have a resource to tap into. You know, there's times where I could imagine a dish. You know, it's kind of like you can imagine a how you want your house to be, but that don't mean that you can build it per se, right? And so you have to have an architect or some construction or some contractor. And so for me, there's, and that's how I continue to learn. I dream of things and like I have a resource to tap into to help build it or bring it to life. But as far as the cuisine, like I just wanted to do the food that I grew up eating, food that means everything to me um a lot of times i've noticed in this industry that a lot of people come on come out of culinary school which i didn't attend but come out of culinary school and they chase whether black latino white Asian, whatever they chase these european dishes and european cuisines because they feel that those are the upper echelons and so i just wanted to bring the food that i grew up eating up to that level pay respect to what i inherited you had this book california soul i mean how would you describe that what does that look like in food california soul an american epic of cooking and survival the book is my memoir it's not a good mm -hmm. book. i do california soul food and then my book is california soul because i that i am i was born and raised in california so this is where my soul is at you know california soul food is just food i grew up eating Deframed and reframed, um, mm -hmm. using California ingredients, showcasing the beautiful bounty that California has to offer, um, utilizing the influence, the multicultural influence that California has. You know, I really believe that soul food is food created out of love with the intent to nourish, sustain, and feed the soul of the individual to carry them over a journey or a period of time before they need to eat again. And so I believe with that being my idea around soul food, it's not based upon a, an ingredient um, or a region or a culture. It's just food created out of love with the intent to nourish, sustain, feed the soul. So I can use any ingredient. You know, I can bring in many cultures. I can blend dishes. 
right? This is how I view it. And this is, I create what I'm imagining what soul food looks like. So when you say blend a dish, you must have a, a very good, t be able to taste stuff. My wife is a chef and she's been able to put things together. And I think that's a great ability to be able to taste certain tastes and combine those tastes. Do you think it's mm -hmm. that kind of kind of way? You know, if you think about oxtails in the South, you have onions, carrots, and celery. Okay, so I'll bring that in. And then I'm, I may add some miso and soy, which brings an Asian infusion. You know what I'm saying? Things like that. You have in the South, you make collard greens. Uh, you may have smoked ham hock or smoked turkey there. But I make collard greens instead of using the meat. I take a, a fancy technique of taking oil and smoking it and infusing the flavor and going through all these different fancy techniques and then take that oil and just add it to the greens to bring that same um, mouth or mouth feel and smoky flavor without meat in it, right? So this is what I mean by California, you know, doing things that we do here, eating, creating food, Southern, I mean, soul food in a form in which in style, which we eat in California, which is lighter and cleaner. It's healthier soul food. I, I mean, in comparison, to uh, other regions, yeah, like I, I, I'm not gonna have two pounds of butter and no yams. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking it because at home I might make it and eat it. You know, my fact, like traditionally, I love traditional soul food, but in a restaurant, like I just California soul food is what we do. My partner here, John Gauntlet, he's from Jamaica. And they love heavy sauces, heavy, heavy sauces, heavy flavors on everything. Is there a lot of flavor and a lot of sauces and stuff in your style of cooking? Absolutely. Like sauces are the, like, that's the flavor bombs. Like, so yeah, like we really are, uh, yeah, we really make, we make everything in our restaurant besides ketchup, every sauce, every mayo, everything we make it. And like we, yeah, flavor. Flavor. Sauces is where the flavor's at. Sauces is where you can take things to another level. Uh, sauces is where you can blend cultures and flavors. Yeah, sauces are important. And I think we do a great job with our sauces. So you would say California's soul food is healthier, lighter, but still has the, the flavor in the sauces. It's lighter and it's just as authentic. Like we are not taking nothing away from traditional soul food. We just, instead of using heavy cream or whole milk in the cornbread, we use our almond milk, right? Because it's lighter. And it's just things like that. Like we use almond milk in our cornbread. We use smoked oil that we make in-house in our collard greens and red beans instead of heavy meat. Just, just stuff like that. So when's the TV show coming out? This whole situation with writers, <laughs> man, I don't know. I can't even talk about it. I don't know what's going on. But what I'm saying is, I've never seen a television show focused on the detail of California that you, soul food that you just spoke about. I'm saying you're pitching a whole new show. Um, oh, okay. So about California soul food. Yeah, maybe that needs an icon to to head that up. I mean, there's something to that because this is all I hear. I hear this from my wife, and she's she's a you know she's a vegetarian. I'm not, um, but she's been able to cook everything, you know. And she's a ta she's a, a taste tester type of person. She can, like mm -hmm. I said, she she understands taste. So to me, I, and I think that even to her. You know, being Asian and so forth, I think that would be very, very interesting to her. I think she could learn the way she cooks. I think she could learn stuff from that, you know, that could, she could integrate in her own recipes. A lot of recipes are just traditional. Just They just are what they are. You know, mm -hmm. cornbread has its cornmeal, flour, sugar, butters, creams, uh, milk or whatever. And it's like pulling the recipe apart and you're like, okay, where can I take this and make it my own? So, mm -hmm. like, take my cornbread, for instance, like I was mentioning. Okay, we have milk. Can, it, can we swap that out? What can we swap it out with? Almond milk. Okay, mm -hmm. what almond milk brings to the table? That's this nuttiness. How do we enhance that? What else is in there? Okay, the, the, the butter. Okay, what if we brown the butter? Now that pairs with that nuttiness, right? So you brown the butter, you add the almond milk, you make the cornbread, right? Boom, that's sauce. That's California. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Almonds are, you know, not native here, but very, like, accessible here um, mm -hmm. in California. And so we use almond milk. I do a lot of brown butter, you know, clarified butter, things like that, right? And it kind of, like, it lines things up a, a lot. 
the, the, the light stinks up a lot. And it just, I mean, it's our own unique flavor. Still, yeah, mm-hmm. it's still cornbread, but it's ours. You know what I mean? It's ours. What's been your biggest accomplishment today? Changing the way I think. Because nothing else happens if I don't do that. Everything follows that. If I'm unable to change the way I think, to change the way I view things, change what I believe, then nothing else happens. I squandered the opportunity. But that's my biggest accomplishment thus far. What's your biggest goals moving forward? To help people change the way they think. How would you do that? Just remain tangible. You know, a lot of times um, we we get out of situations and we move remove ourselves completely. And so then there's no example for the people behind you to be inspired or, or to see a path or or to even see what what can happen if they change what they think, right? So just remain tangible, remain accessible to people, get back in the trenches, you know, be amongst the people to be an inspiration and to give people hope, or just to even allow people to, to see what I was able to accomplish and, and hopefully they can believe that they can accomplish it too and support them on that journey. You know, right now, like my thing is, I provide opportunity. Like I, I hire people that was in my situation, from me in my situation. I hire people coming up from prison. I hire people that's overcoming drugs. I hire people that wouldn't get a job nowhere else. And I'm in the kitchen. I'm working with them. I'm training them. And I'm not focused on cooking, teaching them how to cook because they're going to learn how to cook in a kitchen. They're going to do that. They're going to burn some fucking bread. We're going to have to cook it again. They're going to get it right eventually. You know, they're going to fry some chicken. They'll put it out too early. Later on, they over time, they're going to get the time. What I'm focused on is being able to help them change the way they think, change the way they see things, and reshape the shit that they believe in. Like, that's what I focus on, and that's just how I feel I'm going to get it done, right? Just being right there next to them, talking to them, letting them see it, sharing my life with them. Yeah, that's it. I will say this. You can't save everybody. Somebody has to plant the seed, right? Yeah. So just plant the seeds. Yeah. You know, just plant the seeds. Like, and, and, I, and I say this, I hear that. No one can save everybody. I'm not can save everybody, but I, I'll never remove myself neither. Like, no one yeah. is going to take me away from, like, at all. I don't fuck how much yeah. success, but how much money, none of that. Like, I'm for the people because I wouldn't even be here without the sacrifices that people in my community made. Like, people died for me to have this opportunity. People sitting in prison for me to have this opportunity. Like, when I was coming up, like, when the shots was fired, that person that was on the side of me that got shot, it could have been me. Mm-hmm. So I would never take this and, and, and forget none of that. Like, I'm here because of the sacrifices that people made, you know? Yeah. And so, like, no, I'm not that guy that's going to take it and run. Hell no. They ain't gonna never happen. I think you just have to manage how you how you give away stuff. I give away money to people and this of which I shouldn't, but the teaching thing is a big deal. And I was yeah, give away money. <laughs> but if I'm already if I'm in a facility and I'm already spending time there, why not yeah. have people around me in that setting? Yeah. You get what I'm saying? I agree. It's yeah. not like going out my way like, okay, I have a facility and be here at this time, I'm giving game away. <laughs> yeah. You know. I'm giving, I'm giving game away. And, and if you want to be a part of that community, that's where we are. And this is what it takes, you know, yeah. to be a part of that community. Because I'm giving game away and I'm learning game from the people that's around me. And, and that's what I mean. It's not like, yeah, no, yeah. I'll also kill me if I just went around giving <laughs> the money away. <laughs> I said that because I hear my wife saying, John, you yeah. can't help everybody. You can't help everybody. People come across your path for a reason, you know. Uh, yeah. I'm a firm believer that, you know, you never know. You may be entertaining the presence of an angel, you know, and you can deny that person if you want, you know. Yeah. You just never know. A person comes to you for me, it may be an angel, you know. You might be tested. You might be in a test. So if I'm in a position to help you, because it, it, it can be, and, and honestly, it can be the last thing. In my, I, I can be my last. I'll give it because I have opportunity to get more. Like, I'll be without momentarily. If I don't give them that, they may go the rest of their life without. And I'm just talking about knowledge, information, time, love. You know what I mean? I give it because they may not have no other resource. Are you in your kid's face all the time? All the time. Yeah. All the time. You know, I have my struggles too because I had kids in my previous lifestyle who, you know, had, like you say, through those early on, early ages of formation and been trained a certain way 
and it's kind of hard to get them to see things from how I feel now, but I'm working on them, you know, I'm working on them. But then I have kids now that, like, that's, you know, but I'm in, I'm in my kids' lives um, gotcha. as much as, as much as some of them want me to be and as much as I can be. So where do, where do we find you in LA? Find me all over LA, baby, all over LA, man. I'm a Roman. No, out to Adam's restaurant. 5359 West Dallas Boulevard, but then we also are opening up Loco back. So Loco is a restaurant that I got my very first job ever in my life at 34 years old. That set me on this path. It closed um, two years after it opened. And now that I went out and got myself stable and situated, um, my partner and I down Patterson is going back to open Loco back up as a, you know, culinary um culinary school and job training for job placement so it's we're opening a restaurant as a nonprofit. where do we find if people want to check out your memoir any and everywhere books are sold audio book is um, also available with me actually reading the audio book um if you want to hear me tell you a good story yeah why you rolling grab that audio book but the the, the, the hard covers are wherever books are sold Salt cover be out next month. Great inspiration, great story. I think people can learn a lot from this conversation, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This has been Chef Extraordinaire Keith Corbin with that California Soul Food, and I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm-hmm.